Now, we looked at some discrete probability <laughs> distributions last time. In particular, we looked at uh, some properties of the binomial distribution and then I pointed out that the binomial distribution went over into the Poisson distribution uh, in a certain limit, well defined limit. We also looked at a simple physical example of uh, the binomial distribution which is density fluctuations, number density fluctuations, uh, number fluctuations in an ideal gas, classical ideal gas. Okay. If you recall, the formula we had for the binomial distribution was uh, P of n was n n minus n where n runs uh, from 0 up to capital N here. That was a binomial distribution and this is uh, the distribution of a set of Bernoulli trials, n Bernoulli trials, capital N Bernoulli trials, each with a probability little p of success. And then I pointed out that if you took this limit in which, by the way, the average value of n was equal to n times p. And if you took a limit in which n tends to infinity and p tends to 0 such that this number is finite at some value mu, then uh, the probability distribution tends in this limit, n tends to infinity, p tends to 0, n p tends to some value mu, some constant value mu. This tends to the Poisson distribution which is e to the minus mu mu to the n over n factorial. And the mean value remained of course at mu and this distribution now uh, n has the sample space 0, 1 all the way up, all the way to infinity. Okay. All right. So we needed a simple example of this distribution and uh, many, many abound, Poisson distributions abound in nature. We will come across many, many Poisson distributions. Poisson processes in fact as we go along. But for the moment let me point out that if you did this uh, elementary uh, nuclear physics example of uh, taking a large sample of a radioactive sample and asking um, what is the average number of uh, decays that take place, nuclei that decay in some given, in a, uh, till some, in some given interval of time you discover it increases linearly with the time with some mean decay rate lambda. So you discover that the number is distributed exactly as in a Poisson distribution with an average mu which is equal to lambda t where lambda is the, how, uh, is the mean rate of decays. Okay. So that is a classic example of a Poisson process. I also said uh, I would give you an example based on uh, a number statistics exactly as in the case of the classical ideal gas and this is afforded uh, not by black body radiation which had a geometric number distribution of photons if you recall but rather by coherent light. So ideal single mode that is one single frequency, one given wave number, wave vector, one state of polarization. If you look at ideal single mode laser light, it turns out that the number of photons in this radiation field is described by a Poisson distribution, once again precisely a Poisson distribution. For that, let me uh, go back a couple of steps and do a little bit of quantum mechanics to tell you where this emerges, where this comes from at least in a kind of uh, non-rigorous way and this has to do with the idea of coherent states in quantum optics. Such a state is described by uh, an, a state which is expandable in a basis set which comprises photon specific photon number states and if I call uh, the state N a state of the radiation field in which there are N photons, exactly N photons of a given frequency and a given state of polarization, then the so called coherent state is built up of a superposition of these states and it looks like this it looks like a summation from n equal to 0 to infinity e to the minus half modulus alpha squared. I will explain what these symbols mean alpha to the power n over square root of n factorial where alpha is any complex 
number. So you give me an arbitrary complex number alpha of finite modulus and I construct this superposition of number states of specific numbers and this state here is denoted by this symbol alpha labeled by this complex number alpha as you can see when you change alpha you get a different state and so on and it is called a coherent state. Okay. Now there are technical reasons as to why it is called a coherent state, what is so specific, what is so special about this state and so on. We would not get into that at the moment here because it is not uh, the focus is not on quantum optics but I merely want to point out that in this coherent state it is not very difficult to show that you get precisely a Poisson distribution for the number because after all if you want to ask what is uh, the probability amplitude that in this state alpha you have precisely some fixed integer number say r photons that is given by this quantity here r on alpha and I presume uh, those of you who are familiar with quantum mechanics will recognize this as a scalar product. It is a complex number in general and it is a probability amplitude that in the state alpha you uh, have exactly r photons. Okay. And when you do that and you use the fact that, so put that in here and this is equal to e to the minus mod half alpha squared summation n equal to 0 to infinity alpha to the n over root n factorial and then you have an r with an n. But you see these number states are all orthonormal to each other. They form an orthogonal basis. The orthogonality of the basis implies that orthonormality of the basis implies that this quantity is a Kronecker delta. It is equal to 0 if n equal to r and it is equal to unity if n is, uh, is, is 0 if n is not equal to r and it is unity if n equal to r just a Kronecker delta which helps you immediately to write down what this sum is because this sum fires only when n is equal to r and therefore this becomes equal to e to the minus half mod alpha squared alpha to the power r over square root of r factorial. Okay. That is the probability amplitude. And the rule of quantum mechanics is if you give me the probability amplitude for something to happen, the actual probability is not a complex number, it is the modulus squared of this complex amplitude and therefore the probability that in this state you have r photons is given by this quantity r alpha whole squared and that is easy to figure out because you get another such factor here. So it is e to the minus mod alpha whole squared. And then you have, since you want the complex conjugate is alpha on the left and r on the right is the complex conjugate of this number here. This is a real number, that is a real number, this is a complex number, so you have got to do alpha star to the power r that makes it mod alpha squared to the power r divided by r factorial because there are two of these factors, the square root goes away. And of course you immediately recognize that this is a Poisson distribution with mean value equal to mod alpha squared, right. Okay. So the photon number distribution in ideal single mode laser light of a given state of polarization and frequency is a Poisson distribution, very drastically different from the geometric distribution that we had earlier because we know what the variance of a Poisson distribution is. We know that uh, if this is the distribution, we know that the mean value n equal to mu and we know that the variance of n is also equal to mu. The mean is equal to the variance that is fairly easy to derive because we know the generating function for this distribution and therefore it is trivial to compute that show that the variance is also equal to the same is the same as the mean. That is one of the properties fundamental properties of a Poisson distribution. Now compare this with so, so what does it uh, mean if I have a, a number distribution that is a photon number distribution that is Poisson. So if you have ideal 
single mode coherent radiation the p of n is equal to e to the minus some average value mu mu to the power n over n factorial on the other hand for thermal radiation the p of n was a geometric distribution very different from a poisson and we saw that this thing here is 1 over 1 plus mu and then there was a mu over 1 plus mu to the power n. So, this was Poisson, this is geometric. The variance in this case equal to mu itself. The variance in this case here, so this immediately implies the variance is mu, the standard deviation is square root of mu, and the standard deviation divided by the mean is 1 over square root of mu, okay. And therefore, delta n over n equal to 1 over square root of mu. That is in that case. Okay. On the other hand, here the mean value equal to mu, and the variance not difficult to show this is mu times 1 plus mu that is trivial to show from this expression here and this will immediately imply delta n over n equal to well the mu there is a square root out here and then this is going to give you a square root inside. So, this is equal to square root of 1 plus 1 over mu and as mu increases when you have a large number of photons this scatter becomes extremely small. On the other hand, this scatter is always bigger than 1. This ratio is always bigger than 1, showing that in thermal radiation you have a huge scatter about the mean, whereas relative fluctuation is very, very small in coherent radiation. So, one of the defining properties of this coherent radiation. Okay. Now, these results are very easily derived if you use the generating function in each case. We know the generating function for this, we know the function for this, and it is uh, trivial to do this. So, I urge you to do this as an exercise. So, in some sense, the most coherent radiation you can have is ideal single mode laser light, and the least coherent one you could have is black body radiation thermal. And what is happening is that you have a distribution which goes all the way from here to here. It would be nice to have a family of probability distributions which interpolate between these two extremes okay. and we are going to see very shortly that there is such a family it is called the negative binomial distribution which is going to interpolate between the geometric distribution on the one hand and uh, the Poisson distribution at the other extreme here. In fact, one can use that family of distributions to analyze photo, uh, photon counting statistics and see how much of thermal light is admixed is mixed with the uh, with the coherent radiation in an actual experiment. Okay. But before we do that, let me uh, take up another question and that is the following. What happens if we have a sum of two Poisson distributions? if you have a sum of two random variables each of which is Poisson distributed okay, with different means in general. What would happen? Let us suppose that you have two species of radioactive nuclei and you are trying to count what is the total number of decays in a given time. The rate at which one of them decays is lambda 1 and the other one is lambda 2. So, each of them as I said is a Poisson distribution at any given instant of time and the question is this the question you can reasonably ask is what is the actual uh, distribution of the sum of these two processes of these two random variables. Okay. So, let us suppose that you have one random variable n which is distributed p 1 of n in a Poisson manner mu to the n over n factorial and you have another m which is distributed also in a Poisson distribution, but with a different mu.
and we would like to know what is the probability distribution of the random variable s defined as m plus m. And I would like to know what is p of s. Now what would you say it is? How would you approach this problem? These are independent of each other, completely independent of each other. So a fundamental, a basic first principles way of writing down the probability distribution of S is to say that this is equal to, you try to make up S in all possible ways by summing M and N. And first of all, what is the sample space of S? So what is the sample space of S? Also 0 to infinity, hmm? also 0 to infinity. So th that way there is no change in the sample space. So what you have to do is to say, let us suppose the first variable, the n has a distribution p1 and then a p2 of m and you sum over all possible values 0 to infinity, summation n equal to 0 to infinity subject to the constraint that m plus n is equal to s and that should by definition give you the probability distribution of s. Remember that m and n are dummy indices here, they are summed over, so the answer is a function of s and it fires only when m plus n is equal to s for any given value of s. So that is the definition and what we got to do is to put this in here and then do the summation but you cannot independently sum over m and n because there is a constraint here. So you should use that constraint, you get rid of one of the sums but it will constrain the other sum. For instance, n neither m nor n can exceed s because they are the sums of two non-negative integers, s is the sum of two non-negative integers. For any given value of s, m can at best go up to s and so can n at best go up to s. So while you can do the summation in principle, the sum will get constrained here and you got to be a little careful in doing this. On the other hand, you could do the following. You could say, all right, let us suppose f of z, let us call the generating functions for this and this f1 and f2 of z and then we could do the following. We could say, what is the generating function? of the sum that is equal to this by definition z to the power s but this p of s I put this in here and you can see that this is equal to a summation over n equal to 0 to infinity summation n equal to 0 to infinity and then I plug this in I multiply both sides by z to the power s and sum over all possible values of s okay. So there is a summation s equal to 0 to infinity of this guy and then you have uh, p1 that is e to the minus mu plus mu uh, and then what? So remember that uh, yes over m factorial n factorial here and then you have e to the power uh, you have z to the power so mu to the power uh, this is, this is a better way of doing this than this. Uh, there is got to be a much better way of doing this. Uh, mu to the power n, mu to the power m, z to the power s but subject to the constraint m plus n equal to s. So all I have to do is to put that in here. This becomes z to the power n nu to the power m, ah, sorry z to the power n plus m in here okay and that is it. Okay. So what is this equal to now? I have used the constraint here, I have finished off the sum over s because I have used that constraint to replace s by n plus m. Okay. 
and what does this become? Mu n mu z to the power n nu z to the power m and each of the sums can now be done completely. There are no further constraints on it. Therefore, this gives me e to the power mu times z minus 1 plus mu times z minus 1. And all we need to do is to take out the coefficient of any power that we want to find p of s. We need the coefficient of z to the power s in the power series expansion of this quantity in a power series in s. Okay. And therefore, this immediately follows that p of s equal to e to the power minus mu plus nu, mu plus nu to the power s over s factor. And what is that distribution? It is a Poisson distribution with the means added up. Okay. Therefore, the variance is also added up. Variance of S is the same as the variance of this plus that. Incidentally, one can show ab initio that if you have two random variables which are independent of each other, statistically independent of each other, their variances must add up. Their means must definitely add up, that is a trivial thing to show, but the variances also add up. Why is that? Why do I say that the variances add up? Because the only place they need would not add up if you try to find the mean square value of m plus n for example, the sum of two random variables, you would have the mean value of m squared, the mean value of n squared and then the mean value of m times n, right? But that factors, that factors because these are independent variables. Since it factors, it cancels out when you subtract the mean whole squared immediately. So, it is trivial to see that the variances have this additive property which the mean square value of a random variable does not. So, if a random variable is a sum of two or more random variables which are independent of each other, then the mean value is just the sum of the means of the individual components and the variance also is a sum of the variances of the individual components, a property which is not shared by the mean square alone or any higher moment. Okay. So, this invariance is very crucial and we will see that it is actually a reflection of a property of what are called cumulants which also add up in additivity of cumulants is very, very a fundamental notion. We will come back to that. Okay. So, our first lesson, if you have two Poisson random variables which are independent, the sum is also a Poisson variable added up in this fashion. I urge you to show that uh, in this instance, for example, a slightly more general property. Huh? Suppose A and B are any real constants, positive say, then uh, or negative, does not matter, real constants. Consider the random variable. Let me use a symbol for this random variable. Let us call it u. This is equal to A times n plus B times m. This random variable does not have necessarily integer values in sample space because it is uh, m and n are integer valued, but A and B are any constants, real constants. Uh, then uh, what is the mean value of mu, uh, u? Okay. What do you think is the variance of it is a squared because you are now finding the variance. So, it is a squared variance of m plus b squared variance of m, ah, the other way, n plus m in this fashion. Okay. Now, you know this uh, property that the sum of two Poisson variables is again a Poisson random variable follows very simply from the fact that the generating functions essentially multiply and the generating functions multiply and because they are exponentials because of this property here you get an additive uh, exponent out here. So, you can see clearly that this is going to happen anyway. But now I could ask a slightly more complicated question. 
what about the difference of two Poisson random variables? What do you think is happen, going to happen there? So let us go back and ask uh, what happens if I consider not the sum but the difference, let us call it r uh, equal to m minus n. What kind of distribution would this have? What would, what would this uh, do? Uh, what is the sample space of r? Minus infinity to infinity now, not 0 to infinity, all integers. All integers are allowed, right? And now we try to find out what is the generating function of this uh, thing here. Well, we do exactly the same as we did here, except we now have to write r equal to minus infinity to infinity p of r, r to the power s, and it is the same as this, except that you are going to have to write, uh, let's, let me put the symbols back here, p1 of n, p2 of m, and then we multiplied by, sorry, what did I do here, z to the power r, z to the power r, and if I plug that in here, I get a z to, there is going to be a delta function of m minus n comma r and I am confusing n and m all the time. So this is p1 of n, that is correct, uh, p2 of m, so let us call n minus m so that I do not get confused between 1 and 2. I call this 1 and this 2, so <coughs> n and m and then I have a delta function of n minus m comma r and if I multiply by z to the r, I replace that by z to the power n minus m. So this becomes z to the power n, z to the power minus m. So this guy is equal to f1 of z and f2 of 1 over z because this power series with z to the power m is going to give me the generating function f1 but now it is 1 over z to the power m, right. And what is that equal to? For a Poisson, this becomes equal to e to the power minus mu. Uh, sorry, mu times z minus 1, e to the power nu times 1 over z minus 1. Which is equal to e to the minus mu plus nu and then e to the power mu z minus uh, plus nu over z. And what we seek is the coefficient of z to the power r in the expansion of this quantity in powers of z, okay. But then all possible powers, positive as well as negative powers are going to exist and it is not so easy to first you expand this and then you expand that and of course for a given power z to the power r an infinite number of terms are going to contribute because there is an infinite series in positive powers here and negative powers out here. So we need a little formula. What we need is something called a generating function for a special function. So we need an identity which is the following e to the power 1 half t times some xi plus 1 over xi when expanded in powers of xi positive as well as negative. This guy here is a summation r equal to minus infinity to infinity xi to the power r and it is multiplied by t. This here is the modified Bessel function of the first kind and order r. 
it has got nice interesting properties, I will come, we will come back when we study random box, we will come back to this special function, I will tell you all about it. But it satisfies a certain second order differential equation called the Bessel's modified, the modified Bessel equation. It is a nice function, it is what is called an entire function in the sense that it has no singularities whatsoever for any finite value of t as a complex variable, it is a nice entire function. It can be written as a power series in T which converges absolutely for all finite values of mod T. Okay. So, see, converges even faster than the exponential does, the power series in T. But whatever it is, we can write down what the answer is based on this, from this guy here. Because this here, we can cast it in that form. What the trick is, how should I cast this in that form? I need a xi and a 1 over xi. But I got a mu z and a nu over z, so what should I do? I want to make it some variable xi and it is reciprocal. Take out mu, that does not help. Root mu nu. Take out a square root of mu, yeah. So take out a square root of mu nu and then you have square root of mu over nu z plus square root of nu over mu 1 over z outside the square root, you have this. But you need a 2 out there, so you put that 2 in by hand, you write it in this form and that will immediately tell us that p of r in this case is equal to e to the power mu plus nu. Uh, square root of mu over nu to the power r because I want the coefficient of z to the power r in the expansion. So that is got this guy sitting with it and then i r of twice square root of mu. Okay. This factor here depending on whether mu is bigger than nu or nu is bigger than mu is going to be dominated by either positive or negative r, one of the other. So it is just a power factor there. The Bessel function itself i r has an interesting property. It says i r, i sub r for any positive integer r is equal to i sub minus r. It has got this symmetry property. So the bias is entirely in this. i r of anything or xi, the i r of t equal to i minus r. Yeah, that. Okay. So it is not at all, not at all a Poisson distribution, it is a more complicated distribution than that. Uh, by the way, this is, uh, guy has got a name, this thing here is called a skellum. If you like, it is the generalization of the Poisson distribution to all integers, to a sample space which is both positive as well as negative integers and 0. So this is the uh, skellum distribution here and the difference of two Poisson variables has a skellum distribution. Okay. Now we already know the generating function. This is the generating function for this distribution. So from here it is possible to find all the factorial moments fairly straightforwardly without any difficulty. Uh, for example, the average value of r will turn out to be mu minus nu. That follows immediately if you differentiate this once with respect to z and set z equal to 1, you get this immediately. What about the variance? What do you think will happen to the variance? Well, remember we looked at a distribution of a n plus b m and we said a and b are just real numbers, it does not matter whether they are positive or negative. So you could set one of them equal to 1 and the other equal to minus 1 and of course immediately it follows that this guy is equal to mu plus mu. Okay. So when you have the difference of two Poisson variables, the mean of course is the difference but the variances still add up. 
In fact, we will see a little later that the cumulants, this is called the first cumulant, this is called the second cumulant and then there are higher cumulants and so on. We will see that uh, the kth cumulant of the difference of two Poisson variables will be the first cumul mean plus minus 1 to the power k times the second. So, every other chi will going to be this and every odd cumulant is going to be this in this case. For the sum of course, all the cumulants are going to be exactly the same. We will see that when we talk about cumulants here. Okay. So, he, this is an instance of uh, what happens to the difference of the two. Just one final remark about uh, a physical example once again of such a situation. We will see extensively that the solution to the simple random walk problem in continuous time is precisely a skelum distribution. So, if you did the following, if you took a coin and you had an infinite linear lattice, started at some origin and you tossed a coin and went to the right with some probability little p and to the left with probability little q depending on whether you got heads or tails and you did this at random instance of time with some mean rate according to a Poisson process, then the probability of landing up at the point r on this lattice, on the lattice point r positive or negative does not matter is precisely this skelum distribution. Okay. So, this will be the difference of two Poisson processes. In other words, steps to the right and steps to the left would be regarded as two Poisson processes and then you want the difference of the two. And we will see all the various places at which in which this random walk problem, uh, various problems map on to the solution to this random walk problem. We will see how that comes about. Okay. Uh, we should probably take a little gap here and then uh, any questions? of uh, your random variables with the coefficients being positive. So, if you take alpha times n plus beta times n and yes. you look at the probability distribution of this random variable, alpha and beta being positive, yes. does that still follow a positive uh, If alpha and beta are not integers, that is not true anymore. So, his question is what happens if I did that, which is precisely what we had written down. So, let us call the variable uh, u equal to a times n plus b times m a b real constants. And then ask what is the probability distribution of u itself. Okay. This is not Poisson, it is not Skellum or anything like that because the sample space is no longer integers. Right? It is any a times integer plus b times another integer. So, it is again a set of points, but the question is what is the probability distribution in this case. One way to do this is to go right back to what uh, the, the ab initio definition of this uh, quantity and instead of writing a chronic delta, you write a Dirac delta function of u minus a n plus b m okay? and then write a representation for that Dirac delta function perhaps as an exponential which factors n and m and find the generating function of this u in terms of the generating functions of n and m. Exercise for the reader to do this. Okay. So, that is a nice interesting exercise to find out what is the probability distribution. So, do the following, write this uh, uh, thing in terms of, uh, so use, use a delta function of u uh, a n plus b m minus u, put this formally inside the summation for n and m put this guy formally, but you want to factor out, this is additive in n and m, you want to factor it out and make it into some product of something or the other. Hmm? When you got a sum and you want to convert it to a product, what do you do? You exponentiate, you exponentiate, right. So, you would like to find a representation for this delta function which converts it into an exponent okay? and you use a thing like uh, delta of any real variable x is integral e to the i k x d k. You write a Fourier representation for it. So, put that in here. You are going to have one more integration to do, but that is not very difficult to do. 
and then you will end up with the generating function. Okay. So, that is an interesting exercise. So, uh, recall the binomial distribution which was uh, P of n binomial distribution was uh, P of n equal to n n p to the power n uh, q to the power n minus n. But the negative binomial distribution also has two parameters one of which is a positive integer capital N and the other is a little p exactly as in this case. But this distribution p of n is actually equal to n minus n plus 1 uh, n, pl n plus n minus 1 and then n here p to the power n and q to the power little n in this case huh, where n equal to any positive integer and the sample space here is n equal to 0, 1, 2 all the way up to infinity unlike the case of the binomial where 0 less than equal to n here it goes all the way up to infinity. It is immediately clear that if you put capital N equal to 1 for example, this is 1 that cancels there and this symbol becomes 1 and then of course, it becomes p times q to the power n which was precisely the geometric distribution. So, it is clear that uh, n equal to 1 corresponds to the geometric distribution. And the question is what is it in general? What is it for ca general capital N? What does it look like? Well, the thing to do is again to find the generating function. So, f of z is summation p of n z to the power n and this time n runs from 0 to infinity and I plug in this in there. So, this is equal to little p to the power n, n equal to 0 to infinity, n plus n minus 1 little n and then you have uh, q z to the power n. Now, that is an infinite series on this side. However, it is not very hard to show that this is equal to p to the power n over 1 minus q z to the power n. It is precisely the binomial expansion of 1 minus q z to the power minus n and that is the reason for calling it the negative binomial distribution. Okay. As you know when the index is not a positive integer this binomial series is an infinite series and it simplifies if you write it in terms of gamma functions and so on it simplifies to this guy here. Okay. So, once we have this it is easy to see what is the mean value of n equal to if I call this mu say definition of the mean value is mu this is equal to the derivative of this with z set equal to 1. If I differentiate it I am going to get out here a p to the n and then there is a 1 minus q to the n plus 1. So, there is going to be a p in the denominator and an n which comes from there. So, it is equal to n n q by p because this is going to become n plus 1 when I differentiate it. So, that is a p to the capital n plus 1 and it cancels against p to the n and a q comes out on differentiation the minus sign goes away. So, it is this that is the mean value. Now, of course, we know already that for the geometric distribution when you put this equal to that uh, 1 it is q over p we know that already. Let us uh, rewrite this a little bit and let us write this as uh, mu equal to n times 1 minus p over p which means that uh, mu plus n p equal to n or p equal to n over n plus mu and q of course is mu over n plus mu. 
1 minus p is mu over n plus nu. Then if I put that into the distribution into this guy uh, p of n equal to n plus n minus 1 factorial divided by n factorial n minus 1 factorial that is the John combinatorial part and then a p to the n that is n to the power n over n plus mu to the power n that is p to the capital N q to the power little n that is mu to the power n over n plus mu to the power n. That is what this uh, two parameter distribution looks like in terms of n and mu instead of p and q I got rid of p and n I got rid of p and use mu instead yeah, this guy here okay. Now look at what happens when capital N goes to infinity keeping mu finite at some value what does it do? So p of n this is going to give me an n to the power n plus n to the power n plus n dominant term by Stirling's approximation. This is going to give me an n to the power capital N this guy here is going to look like 1 over 1 plus mu over n to the power n if I divide through by this n to the power n it is just this fellow here and then you have a mu to the power n and you got an n to the power capital N n to the power capital N and n to the power little n this gave you n to the power little n plus capital N. So this leading term cancels against this and that and leaves you with just this and you cannot forget this. So that is sitting there and the limit of this of course is e to the power mu. So that goes up on top and you get e to the minus mu okay which is precisely a Poisson distribution. So we have this family of negative binomial distributions which uh, tends n equal to 1 geometric and n tends to infinity Poisson. Okay. So that is the great advantage of this uh, distribution. And it is got a very nice, very simple looking generating function. We wrote it down as just an algebraic function here. Okay. So we can write down all its moments and so on. Okay. As I said, one uses this in the study of photo electron, photo, photon counting statistics for admixtures of thermal light and coherent light, among other things. There are many other places in population dynamics, etc., where the negative binomial distribution is used very, very frequently. Just one final remark and then we will take it up from here. We have talked about the generating function throughout okay? and while it has advantages, it also has disadvantages. So our definition of the generating function was equal was that if you had a probability distribution p of n of a random variable n, then I defined the generating function as this summed over all allowed values of n. That was my definition of the generating function. On the other hand, I could also ask, oh, the, the disadvantage of this was that if I want various moments of this distribution with various powers of n here, I have to go on differentiating this. But if I differentiate this uh, k times, then I actually end up with plus 1. This average was dk f of z over dz to the power k at z equal to 1. So I actually find the factorial moments rather than the moments themselves. Okay. To overcome that disadvantage, its advantage is to define what is called a moment generating function 
and that is defined as m of u, I will use a different variable u instead of z, so as not to confuse the two. This is equal to the average value of e to the power u n. but the average value of e to the power u n is summation over the allowed values of n p of n e to the u to the power n. Okay. e to the u to the power n is e to the n u, so this is all it is and therefore we have our relation which says the generating function and the moment generating function are related by m of u is f of e to the power u. So instead of z to the power n I got e to the u to the power n. So if I know f I know z m and vice versa. The great advantage of this is that if I differentiate this after all if I take this and write this as summation n equal to 0 to in k equal to 0 to infinity out here uh, u to the power k n to the power k over k factorial expectation because that is a random variable n here. Then immediately you see that n to the power k is the derivative the kth derivative of m of u over du k at u equal to 0. So it directly by differentiation generates the moments themselves and not just the factorial moments. moments. So that is why it is called the moment generating function and it directly gives you the various moments out here. Okay. So that is an advantage and I will stop here but we have seen we have seen that uh, the moments themselves are not that helpful first of all there is an average which you got to remove first of all. So it is not advantageous to use the moments but it is much better to find out what is the average value of n minus n average to the power k and take its expectation value. These are the central moments, these are just the moments but these are the central moments, the moments about the mean value. So any systematic drift or shift is got rid of. For example, the second of these follows when k is 2 is precisely the variance as you can see. Even this is not very useful when you have many random variables because the sum of the central moments of independent random variables is not the sum of the, uh, the, the, the kth moment of the sum is not the sum of the kth moments, central moments. So we need to do exactly what we did for the variance, get rid of those extra contributions and make it purely additive and that is where the cumulants comes in. This is a little bit like uh, if you are used to statistical mechanics, uh, it is a little bit like going from the partition function to the Helmholtz free energy. So what you have to do is to ask can I write, can I write e to the power u n as equal to e to the power some function of u which is in a power series here in general. So this is like saying I take the partition function and then I take its you know the free energy is defined as a log of this guy, this partition function can I do that trick or not and that k of u will be called the cumulant generating function. In fact that is the basic idea in statistical mechanics when you are writing uh, the free the, the partition function you are writing a generating function actually for some distribution and when you find the free energy you are writing the corresponding cumulant generating function and that is what is additive. So we will talk about this next time.